Hello, I'm Ray with yet another podcast episode. Now, you know, I'm always asking for ideas. What should I do? Because to be honest, I'm running out of ideas. Ray emailed me, another Ray. Hello, Ray, if you're listening. Ray suggested hospitals, dentists, doctors back in the 1950s and 60s. What were they like then? And, you know, when you look at hospitals now, what's the difference? Well, obviously, there are major differences. One thing is you walk into a hospital today you're surrounded by electronic equipment, lights flashing, beeping everywhere. There's beeping all over the place, beep, beep, beep everywhere. Wires, cables, whereas the old days, they didn't have that. Well, I think they had one or two beeping things, didn't they? Oscilloscope type looking machines with waveforms on and perhaps the odd beep, but nothing like today. I have first-hand experience of a hospital in the 1960s, early 60s, I fell off my bike. Now, in those days, bikes had those big cow horn type handlebars. Do you remember they were all the rage? All the school kids had them. And I, being a school kid and having a bike, I had these big handlebars. Now, the gears, I stood up on the pedal. My gears slipped, so the pedal just went straight down. The handlebars twisted round and thumped me in my stomach, ruptured my liver. Didn't hurt my skin, the surface, but the blow was enough to rupture my liver. So off I went, knee nor, knee nor, knee nor, as it was then, none of this. So uh, it wasn't quite bells on the ambulance. It was not that old. It wasn't that long ago, but it was knee nor, knee nor. So, OK, hospitals. I've got also stories about dentists. If you don't like that, if you're squeamish, you better miss out. The, I'll warn you about the dentist part because you might want to miss out that a string driven electric drill. Well, it's not electric drill, is it? Well, it is electric, but it's string driven and it runs very slowly and it grinds and your whole head shakes and your tooth is killing you. <laughs> and, the, and the dentist used to gas people. I got gassed on more than one occasion. But let's go back to the hospital. I got to the hospital, I think it was about 11 o'clock in the morning, and I didn't have the operation on my liver until 11 at night. And I was in and out of consciousness. I I really didn't know what was going on. But outside the operating theatre, I was on a trolley waiting to go in. And there was this nurse, a very young student nurse. And she said she was 17. And she was holding my hand. And I had heard someone say, stay with him and keep him awake. So she was telling me all about her boyfriend. And I really wasn't interested. I was in so much pain. But bless her, she was only 17. It must have been... I don't know, quite an experience for her, seeing me there on the trolley, uh, uh, knocking at death's door as I was. Anyway, she was lovely and uh, went in and obviously didn't know anything about the operation. For the first few days after my operation, I didn't really know what was going on. Apparently it was 50-50 whether I lived or died. Uh, Luckily, I didn't know that at the time. It would have been quite worrying. So the first few days, I didn't really know what was going on. But as I slowly recovered and looked round the ward, I realised it was all old men, very old men. Now, bear in mind, I was 14. So anyone over sort of 40 was really old to me. But some of them, they really were in their 70s, 80s, and probably even more than that. Apparently what had happened, I was a little bit too old to go on the children's ward and really a little bit too young to go on men's surgical. So they put me on men's surgical anyway which really wasn't much fun. I'd have far rather been with kids than these old old men who used to disappear. At night, I'd be awake at night. I couldn't sleep very well. They'd draw the curtains around the bed and I'd watch. The lighting was very dim and I'd watch. And then they'd wheel someone out. The next day you'd hear, oh, he's gone. He went in the night. Not a very good environment for a, you know, a lad of 14, really. But there we are. That happened... Well, we won't go into that too much, but that happened almost every night. No, that's not true. I can't say that. But it happened a lot. Now, new patients, ones that had just been operated on or just come in, they were near the main door, near the corridor where the nurse's office place was. As you got better, you were moved down the ward away uh, from the office and towards the end where there was a like a conservatory. There were doors that went out to this big glass section. I think there are only about six beds out there. No, I think there are eight beds out there, four one side of the entrance and four the other. I can't remember. So I'd worked my way down. My bed was moved 
down the ward. I was in about the middle of the ward because I was feeling a lot better. And I was put next to this chap. Now, thinking back, he was like, uh, who's that chap? Is it Carry On Nurse? Uh, Leslie Phillips, wasn't it? And he was always making lewd comments to these young nurses, which, of course, at 14, I found quite amusing. I mean, I dared make any lewd comments, but uh, he was... This nurse came along and he was looking her up and down and winking at me. She was looking at me. Um, I think she was taking my temperature or something. And um, he said, oh, you're, you're a bit of all right. Uh, tell me, nurse, is, is it true that uh, nurses wear suspender belts and stockings? And of course, I started laughing. And uh, the nurse turned around and looked at him and she said, uh, never you mind what we wear. <laughs> I never forget her say that. Never you mind what we wear. And he said, oh, you're, you're a bit of all right, you are. You're a bit of all right. <laughs> and I think she'd heard it all before. I mean, you know, if you work on a on a ward like that, men's surgical, you know, you've heard it all before. I, I don't know how old she was, late teens, early 20s. But whenever a nurse walked past, he was either whistling or saying, oh, I say, you know, we'll have to meet when I get out of here. We'll have to go out for a drink <laughs> and all this. I don't know. Anyway, I eventually worked my way nearer the conservatory section my bed was wheeled down there they didn't sort of take me out of the bed and move me to another bed they just wheeled my bed down there this nurse said to me one day she was just i don't know what she was doing tidying my bed she said dear do you want to phone your parents or something like that anyone you want to phone and i said oh yeah i could phone my parents yeah and she wheeled this telephone and it was a big old sort of wooden trolley thing and on it was a do you remember the old red phone boxes the call boxes with a button A, button B, it was a complete call box. And it was quite amazing. She plugged it in by my bed. Of course, in those days, there were no mobile phones, anything like that. And I thought it was really modern technology that you could wheel this phone around the ward and plug it in beside people's beds. Now, it was actually a bit of a ploy. She'd suggested I phone home because she was about to do something to me. There was a tube in my sticking the side of me into my stomach somewhere, probably into the kind of pelvic cavity. And she slowly pulled this tube out. And I was saying to my mum, the nurse is pulling this tube out. It's ever so long. Oh, it's still going. It's still going. And eventually she pulled the whole thing out, then put a little plaster over the, the hole that was left in my stomach. It went down to a sort of vacuum, a big glass jar, which was a vacuum thing. And the idea was to sort of drain things. Well, we won't go into all that. I don't know what they do these days. It's difficult to compare hospitals back then and, and now. Um, I've not been in hospital, fortunately, for quite a few years. But uh, I have visited people, of course, so I can see a lot of the differences. One difference that I do think is a shame these days. Um, I, I had my stitches out. There was this young nurse. I think they had a lot of student nurses at the time. I don't know why there were so many. Of course, then... Yes, student nurses then, that's one big difference. They were on actual wards, weren't they? They were on wards with live patients. Well, most of us were live. <laughs> Some of us weren't. Though that's the difference. These days, they go to university, don't they? They have no experience of the hospital. I mean, I don't know. This is what I've heard. So then they were put straight onto a ward like men's surgical and thrown in at the deep end. And this little nurse, it was time to take my stitches out. I was almost at the conservatory end of the ward. The next step was the conservatory. And she came up, pulled the sheets down, undid all this dressing. And there's these stitches, as I said, like bits of rope. And she's sort of fiddling around with them. And I'm, oh, 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 oh. And she said, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Poor thing. And she kept saying, oh, so sorry, so sorry. It won't be a minute. I'll get these done. Oh, I'm so sorry. Ah, ah, ah. And this matron, now this is the difference. Hattie Jakes type matron, talking of carry on nurse. She came, she said, what are you doing, girl? This poor girl. She said, I've taken the stitches out, matron. That's not how you do it. Get out of the way. She was literally like that. Get out of the way. And she almost pushed this girl aside. And she honestly, she pulled my stitches out. Good grief. The pain. I was, oh, oh. And she said to me, oh, stop complaining. <laughs> What's the matter with you? I'll never forget that. Stop complaining. What's the matter with you? Because I was thinking, what's the matter with me? Were well, you torturing me? There was blood. This poor little nurse's face, she was looking at me. I thought she was going to burst into tears. There was blood coming out of where the stitches were, had been. Anyway, she did it. And she said to the nurse, now, you know, dress the wound. And off, off she went. 
And this nurse was saying, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I said, don't worry, it's not your fault. But that was the difference back then. The matron was in charge. You know, there was no messing about. Nurses couldn't mess about. And I'm not saying they mess about now, but uh, the matron was in charge. And when, when it was the doctor's round, oh, the matron was right. Tidy up, tidy up, you know, doctor's rounds. And all the nurses had to put away bottles of drink. No, not, not bottles of beer or wine or vodka, but your know, orange juice bottles all put in the cupboards. The whole ward was tidied and everything was neat. You know, there's nothing untidy on our little bedside cabinets, like a newspaper or a magazine thrown. It was all hidden in the cupboards. And then the doctor would come round. Of course, the matron and a couple of nurses would accompany the doctor to each bed. Well, you've seen it all on the telly, haven't you? On the, on the carry-on films. It was just like that. Well, not quite. It wasn't that funny. <laughs> but I do love the carry-on films. They, they never seem to lose their whatever it is, their brilliance. I eventually ended up out in the conservatory and this young nurse came along drew the curtains around me of course i was next to leslie phillips wasn't i i don't know whether he'd arranged that or they'd arranged i don't know but uh i was next to leslie phillips in the next bed and they drew the curtains around me and this young nurse and she said was it a blanket bath or a bed bath i can't remember she said that i've got to wash you and of course that started leslie phillips off are you going to strip him naked nurse Will you be removing your suspender belt and stockings? She totally ignored him. Um, I, mean, I could see her. She was sniggering a bit. I could see her face. She was sort of stifling a, a snigger, I suppose. Anyway, she carried on washing me, totally ignoring these lewd comments from behind, <laughs> behind the curtain. When she'd finished, she said, I'll leave you to wash your naughty bits. Of course, that was it. Leslie, Philip, naughty bits. You can come and wash my naughty bits. Hey, nurse, come in here, come here, wash my naughty bits. She then burst out laughing because I then started laughing and it was really good. He was in the conservatory bit like me. He was due out any day, so he was a lot better. I was obviously a lot better. So it was a good atmosphere down there. We'd all started off down near the office when we were bad, when it was perhaps 50-50 that we would live or die and of course by the time we got to the conservatory i think it was more of a, a balcony i don't know no conservatory is best to describe it if anyone remembers back in the 60s men's surgical ward four worthing hospital there are, i bet a few of you remember that ward four worthing hospital yes happy days well it was happy when i got to that end of the ward anyway because i was due to go home on the day i was to be sent home i had long hair it was the 60s i had long hair and a couple of these young student nurses came along with scissors threatening to cut my hair. Shame I lost touch with them. If, had I been a bit older, no, it probably would have been dreadful. Had I been perhaps 18, <laughs> I'd have been worse than Leslie Phillips. But there we are. That's just one experience of hospital back in the early 60s. Um, it was great. You know, it really was good atmosphere. The food was dreadful. I don't know about hospital food these days, but the food was absolutely disgusting. <laughs> I was seven stone when I came out. I don't know what I was when I went in, but they weighed me. I was seven stone. How about that? I got pretty thin. I was quite tall at 14. So that was my experience of a hospital. Excellent staff, excellent nurses, doctors. Can't praise them enough. Now, if you're squeamish or you don't like the dentist, turn off now. <laughs> the dentist and his torture chamber. My first experience of going to the dentist, I was in a pushchair. So I must have been less than five, I don't know, three, what, I don't know. I can't have been too young, I wouldn't have had teeth. Anyway, I went to this dentist, I remember it, in this pushchair, and he did whatever he did, and it hurt like hell. I had this bib on, and there was blood all down it. I was screaming, I remember screaming. And I was wheeled home by my mother in this pushchair with this bib, and there's blood all down the front. I'm looking down, there's blood pouring out of my mouth. I mean, that's no way to treat a child, take him to the torture chamber. Good grief. The dentist, I remember seeing the drill. It was, as I said earlier, it was a string driven thing, electric motor, presumably somewhere. And then these string things going around pulleys and eventually coming down to the bit where the, the drill bit was, which was spinning. I mean, they're high speed drills these days, but this was slow. It's almost like a hand drill, you know, the old fashioned hand drill. He might as well have used one of those in my mouth. And it was going... Rrr, 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 rrr. My head was vibrating and shaking. There's blood. 
I mean, what sort of profession is that? <laughs> it was a torture chamber. Later in years, I was still a child. I went to this dentist and he gassed me and ripped a tooth out. The gas was, oh, he put this sort of rubber type smelling thing over my face and said, right, breathe in, sniff, breathe in deeply. And I'm going, oh, nearly made me feel sick. I could feel my stomach churn and I, I just sort of passed out, I suppose. I don't know what happened. And again, when I woke up, there's blood everywhere. I said, well, what's going on? You know, what's he done? And the tooth had gone, but uh, masses of blood, you know, pouring out gallons all over the floor. In fact, there was someone put it all into a bucket. That no, wasn't quite that bad. <laughs> gallons of blood. I don't know. I won't go on too much about dentists because, I don't know, it's, uh, it's horrible, isn't it? I must say that my dentist these days, he is very good. He's always welcoming. They sit behind your head now, don't they? They used to stand up and kind of force this drill into your mouth. Whereas now they just sort of sit behind your head and do it kind of upside down, aren't they, from behind your head. It's, uh, I suppose it's more comfortable for them. I don't know, I suppose it's better all round, really. That's enough of dentists. I don't like the places at all. I, I mean, with all due respect to dentists, you know, nothing wrong with you. It's just your torture chamber I don't like. I must have been seven, eight, maybe six, seven, eight years old. My mother took me to the doctor. Now, in those days, the doctor was stern and you didn't speak to him unless he spoke to you. Anyway, she knocked on the door, you know, like you do. Come. This voice from behind the door. Come. So, good grief, that's frightening as it is. So we went in there. He was sitting at a huge desk, writing something with his fountain pen, as you had in those days, and a cigarette in his mouth. He's puffing on a cigarette. It's in his mouth and he's going... <coughs> <coughs> He, he didn't look up. He just said, yes. So my mother sort of walked me up to the desk and she said something about whatever I had, I can't remember. He's got a cold or a fever or something. He looked up, glanced at me, looked back down and, and said, put him to bed, disprint, 24 hours. That was it. And she said, oh, thank you. Okay, thank you, doctor. And we walked out. That was it. I was glad to get out of there. The place was full of smoke. Enough to make you feel ill with all the nicotine in the air. But that was, the, that was the first visit I ever remember to the doctor. I remember his name. I won't mention it. He's obviously long since gone. But um, I remember his name. You know, it had that much of an effect on me, thinking, you know, what is this? There's a, this headmaster-type person sitting behind this big oak, or wood, whatever it was, wooden desk. I don't know what it was made of. And barely looking up and coughing and spluttering on this cigarette. The smoke's all going up through his hair and his eyes. And that was it. That's all they ever did then. Go to bed, Disprin. Disprin was soluble aspirin, wasn't it? I don't know whether it's still available. Do you remember Disprin? That was, oh, and Lucasade, bottle of Lucasade. That's what you had to have. He didn't prescribe that, but uh, you'd get that on the way home, the bottle of Lucasade. When I was considerably older, I had this stomach ache, and I'd had it for on and off for quite a few days, I don't know, a week, a few days a week. So I went to the doctor, because you know, then you could just sort of go in and you didn't have to worry about appointments. You took a, they gave you a number you know, like be number 12, and he'd look on the board on the wall where you hang the numbers, and it'd be, say, number nine. So when it was your turn, you'd hang your number on the board and go in and see the doctor. So I went in there, and it was this female doctor. I remember her name, but I won't mention that. She said, oh, you've got an ulcer. She hadn't examined me. She said, yeah, stomach ulcer. And I said, oh, have I? And I, I didn't know. I mean, she was the doctor, so I thought, oh, fair enough. Yeah, it'll be an ulcer, she said. So <laughs> off I went to... Um, Southlands Hospital over in Shoreham. She made me an appointment to have this barium meal. It's like thick, horrible, radioactive porridge. <laughs> so anyway, I got there and this chap said, right, drink this or eat this or whatever you do. Thick, slimy porridge. And he said, well, what are you here for, an ulcer? He said, you haven't got an ulcer. You're too young. I said, well, I don't know. That's what she said, my doctor. And he was mumbling, doctors, stupid, waste of time. Mumbling away to himself, he was. It was he a radiographer or something? Anyway, he did this X-ray thing. He said, "You haven't got an ulcer." I said, "Oh right, okay. Well, that's that's good news then." He said, "Go back and tell her she's stupid." So I laughed, and he said, "I'm serious. Tell her that I said she's stupid," and he told me his name. You know, I think they all knew each other in those days, didn't they? Or knew of each other. Anyway, I didn't tell the next time I saw her. I didn't say <laughs> he says you're stupid, but. Uh, Again, very, very different these days, doctors' surgeries. It's, I don't know, there was no 
cleanliness. I mean, this old chap behind his desk, it was untidy in there. There was uh, nothing like there is now. It, it all looks bright and clean and hygienic, doesn't it? Then it looked like an old sort of headmaster's study, you know, at a, at a boys' school or something. Come walking in there, you'd expect to get the cane or something. They were happy days, though. In the old days, dentists would pull teeth out, wouldn't they? They don't do that. No, they, well, they do, but they don't like pulling teeth these days. They like to try and save teeth if they can. I think doctors back in the old days, it was, I don't know, with kids especially, discipline, go to bed, couple of days off school. All that was always good. I hated school. Always making out I was ill. Monday morning would come along. You know, this is when I was sort of eight, nine, ten. Monday morning would come along and I'd say, oh, oh, my stomach, oh, I don't feel good. And invariably, I'd get a week off. You know, you had to be clever. I had to do it properly. It's, oh, dear, oh, I feel awful. Do you want breakfast? Oh, no, no, I don't want breakfast. Well, normally, oh, breakfast, yes, I'm starved. But no, no, no breakfast. Wait till nine o'clock, OK? Keep an eye on the time. Once nine o'clock's there, that's it. Too late to go to school. So you can start feeling a little bit better now. Oh, I might have a bite to eat. And if it's summertime, I might go and sit in the garden. My stomach's getting a little bit better. Of course, don't start playing in the garden too much, too early. Because don't forget, Tuesday morning, you've got to be ill again. Well, not again, but carry on. And Wednesday, if you want the week off, you've got to get to Thursday. Because then, well, it's not worth going to school Friday, is it? I mean, you might as well have the day off. So I got that down to quite a fine art in the end. I remember once my mother, she said, I'm not having this day. Off you go to school. So I walked down the driveway to the road and I'm walking along the pavement, leaning on this wall, like I'm staggering, sort of leaning on the wall going, oh, oh dear. It didn't work. <laughs> she took no notice and I had to go to school. Damn it. So there we are. Thanks to Ray, if you're listening, Ray. Thank you for the idea of the hospitals, doctors. Um, I was going to say nurses. Oh dear, those nurses. Had I been a little bit older, but there we are. I was 14. As I said, had I been 18, it would have been, well, it would have been dangerous, wouldn't it? Leslie Phillips and me on a ward together. Good grief. There we are. So thanks for the idea, eh? Um, if anyone's got any other ideas for next Sunday, let me know. Because, as I've said, I do run out of ideas. I think uh, what I'll have to do, if nothing crops up, I'll have to do a general rant and rave and moan and complain. My wife calls me Victor Meldrew. I can't understand why. And another... <laughs> Another person she's associated me with or thinks I'm like is, uh, was it Warren Mitchell? Um, Alf Garnet. <laughs> Actually, I wouldn't mind doing an Alf Garnet type podcast. Imagine that, an episode. Mind you, these days with politically correct things, I'd have to be very careful. It wouldn't work, would it? I mean, do you remember him? It's your labour, isn't it? It's your unions, isn't it? It's your labour. Except there were one or two expletives in between words. There we are. I'll give that one some thought. Alf Garnet. What was it? Till Death Has Two Part, wasn't it? And what was the other one? Um, oh, I can't remember. I'm boring you now. Thanks for listening. See you next week. Bye-bye for now.